You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Just a heads up, this episode contains sensitive themes which may not be suitable for everyone. If you need support, contact Lifeline on 13 11 14. Hello, my love. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And you? Well, I'm so good. All the better for seeing you. I'm going to take off my earrings because okay. they don't fit under my headphones. Sorry about all Sometimes the in this job, I get to speak to the most amazing people with extraordinary stories and strength. People who've gone through things that I couldn't even imagine and come out the other side and are thriving. My guest today is one of those people. I remember the nights were almost in this old home me and my three other friends that he had picked up, we, we shrink in this world, almost trying to get inside it because we, we knew what was going to happen. From Mamma Mia, I'm Mia Friedman and you're listening to No Filter, a weekly interview podcast with people who tell their stories very candidly and aren't afraid to be vulnerable. Aminata conte Biger had a picture-perfect childhood. She grew up in Freetown, in Sierra Leone, which is a country on the southwest coast of West Africa. She lived in a big house with her father and her siblings, and she was happy. Then, one night, her life changed forever. So when we heard these sounds, we all woke up. All we could see was houses being burned and people screaming. There was this owl. Rebel soldiers entered her village. They set fire to all the houses and the land, and they kidnapped her. This no filter goes into some dark, dark places, but Aminata's story of pain and resilience and survival will give you goosebumps. This isn't actually the first time I've interviewed Aminata. I met her in the early days of Mamma Mia and I interviewed her probably a decade ago, but her story has stuck with me ever since. And I wanted to see how her life was going, how she's doing. Here's Aminata. Aminata, before the day you were kidnapped, what was your life like in Freetown where you grew up in Sierra Leone with your sister and your two brothers and your dad? My life was absolutely joyous, even though, again, my experience of kidnap is still in me now. I still think of that life that I lived with my father. I grew up with the most incredible man. I believe that exists. And I have a a home that was very protected, but I felt protected even going outside. My father was very sort of not almost typical African man. He raised us to be, first of all, we had this value of being respectful to our elders and then how we start that from home. I always said that I never saw my dad roll his eyes on anyone. So we started from home, from our siblings, how we talk to each other. And the people that even cooked for us or looked after us, we have to respect them the same way we respect our mothers. And then school education was extremely important, especially for my dad, his girls, his daughters. He wanted us to have education. And he thought if we leave any part of the world, we'll be able to look after ourselves but not depend on anyone. We went to really good school. I always have this vision of my dad every single morning. We, we put his apron on, make us a breakfast and take us to school. We are uh, chauffeur take us to school and brought us home. I didn't get the opportunity to actually miss my mother because I didn't have any memory of my mom. What happened to her? Where was she? She was in Guinea Conakry, so they separated when I was two, two and a half years old. So my father was one of those men, you would take everything from him, but not his children, especially his daughters, because he thought he would be able to secure us to have a better education while our mothers would want us to get married early and school was not a priority. So that was one of the reasons why he wanted us to be with him. So we were all raised by him. And he traveled a lot. He traveled overseas. But there were times that he would put us in boarding school when he knows that we were getting older. And I had siblings in London, my older sisters, they're twins. And they are 57 now. And he took them to London and then put them in school, in boarding school in Scotland. So it was just one of those weird father that does something that you don't hear people do often. I think that was a really good stability for me to come to Australia. So every time I hear people saying, 
oh, my mom was in there, my father was in there. And I thought to myself, well, you can still do something better with your life. You know, you can't live a life of blaming. And I didn't have a mother. Did your mother ever try to look for you? Did you ever find her? Yes, my mother was not so much missing. She comes and visits. But because I had so much strong connection with my father, I didn't really was a child that ran to my mother. She would come and visit every year, every six months. But she was only allowed to see us at home, not out of home. So we were not allowed to go out. My dad was extremely disciplined, very strict. Very strict. Very strict, which we're all grateful for. All the children are. And of course, we get smacked, <laughs> which is here in the West, it's abuse, but we're grateful for. My dad had a sort of way that he would look at you from the other side of the room. His eyes will communicate with you what you're doing wrong. So um, these are things that he has really left with us, that all of us are living in different part of the world. We are nine children and we've all gone and start life and everybody just independent and doing what they want to do with their life. And that was his intention. Polygamy was legal in Sierra Leone. Uh, your father was Muslim and you were brought up Muslim. Did he take other wives after your mum left? Yes, but it is still legal. <laughs> oh, it's still legal? Yeah, it's, it's not even a, um, a legal sentence when it comes to polygamy. <laughs> oh, it's just a thing. It's just what people do. Yes, and also in the Quran, if you can afford and look after your wife and love them equally, which is impossible... You can actually have four wives. Uh, my, my mom was the third wife. When we started growing up with him, when we were living with him, he didn't want us to have another stepmother because he thought that would make everything complicated. So when my stepmom moved to London and my mom and my father divorced, we didn't have a stepmother until we were very old enough going to school and making sure that we are in a place where we are able to respond and look after ourselves because he thought that would be an issue to bring another wife in. So he wanted to take the role of the mother and the father. It sounds like he was very anxious and wary about the role of women in your lives. And you say that that's because women, ironically, don't encourage their daughters to get educated in Sierra Leone, it's more like you've just got to get married young. Is that still the case? It's still the case. My mom wanted me to get educated, but for my mother coming from a different culture, getting married and maybe not even to a man that have two wives, it doesn't seem wrong to her. Because I remember even when I'm in Australia, I would live by myself for eight years. It was almost like something was wrong with me. <laughs> and she was asking me, Are you, have you met somebody? So that was very consistent. So we're very... All the children, we saw what he actually knew. We, we know that that's true, and my mom will not deny that, and all the wives will not deny that. Getting married, having children, that was more something that you've achieved something. While my father, it was more being independent and putting yourself first. If you don't want to get married, that's up to you. He was a feminist, Aminata. Yes. What a feminist he was. Yes. <laughs> so... There was civil war in Sierra Leone and it had gone on for quite some years. Tell us about what was going on on the day that you were kidnapped. You, you had hundreds of people sheltering in your house, didn't you? Must have been a big house. It's a very big house. It looks a bit smaller to me now, but it's huge. So it's four stories, but you have four stories in two in the compound. And it was the biggest house in the area. And I grew up in Freetown, which is the capital city of Sierra Leone. So I remember it was a very ordinary day. We went to bed, go to sleep. Uh, we are very aware of the war. We've seen refugees coming in. We've seen people's hands who were amputated. There was a lot of people begging in the streets. So we saw it. So it was not like a, it's been going on for over 10 years. From 1990 to 1999, that's when they entered the capital city, January 6th. So we were sleeping, uh, we were supposed to go to school the next day, and we just heard a really loud sound. And it was almost like a volcano coming from above and falling. Because what had happened is the rebels were actually in the city dressing like a civilians. They didn't just walk in, they were already living in the city. And they've been fighting for nine years to come to the city because that's where the politicians are and wealthy people are. So when we heard these sounds, we all woke up. When we woke up and looked through our windows, all we could see was houses being burned and people screaming. There was this owl. And from my window side, we could see people running because they've been lit by petrol. 
we start smelling of human being burned and all our houses, the houses around our area, what you can see them on fire. So it was sort of dark, but bright because of the fire and then the smoke. And my house, the window in our house is bulletproof, but also tinted. So I can actually see people outside, but nobody could see us from the inside. So we knew that. And I remember clearly my dad coming upstairs to us. And the reason why he did that, because I live in the middle floor with my sister, was because he knew that this is the end and he didn't want us to go outside. There was no way that he was going to let us run around because that's what happened in war. People just... Just run every in every direction. Yes. So him coming upstairs was to know that we're going to be together if the house was going to be burned. So to be together. He didn't have to say anything. He just wanted to make sure that we were here and we're awake and we see what is happening and the war has entered. What did he say to you? He, as a parent, he, he just looked at us. As I said, my dad, really, the language of him, he would just look at us. We knew this is what happened. We've seen it. We've heard it, but now we're living it. So the idea of us going outside the gate, outside our house, running, that was a no from him. So he didn't even have to say it, but he came upstairs and sat with us. And you had hundreds of people in your house. Why were they there? I never, I think most of, those are the, most of the things that really with my story really get to me because all the houses are being burned. But the one thing that is when you're in a war, you don't go to a house that is bigger. You go to a house that is maybe already been burned because you know they're not coming there. But you don't go to a house that stand. It's a bright yellow house. So we just heard people, they knocked the door and we knew they were civilians and we didn't know any of them, by the way, we didn't know them. They all just came to our house. And that has always really gave me a chill because for all those three weeks, the rebels passed through our house. They never knocked through the gates. They never did. And I know we were protected because it was almost unseen, like, why would we didn't question it, but we knew at any time it would happen. But then the people that came to our house felt really safe that didn't know us. And your father just took them in? He just took them in. He could not turn them away. He didn't understand why they were coming. He didn't question. And he just let them in. And we had enough food at home because my dad, the way we lived at home, we have um, a storeroom where we store food. Truck comes and fill up the store. So there was all enough food to feed the people through the time that we were there. And that, that was, again, another miracle because when, if we were been there for three weeks and people didn't have food to eat, they would have gone out to find food. But because there was enough for everyone, that made it possible for people to stay that long until the day they knocked at our door. And they said that if everyone didn't come out, they were going to set the house on fire. So everybody came out of the house and you gathered in a big open space, like in a park? So next to our house, there's a space there, a little compound, but that is not cement. Our house was cemented. So we went out. But again, when we walked out, we knew that sometimes they would just spray a gun, like just fire and kill everyone. So we, our going there, it was to knowing that this is it also. Did you know what was going to happen to you? Well, we just knew that, that that's the end. We knew that they were just going to kill people. And I've already, going through my house, I've already seen a lot of horror that was happening around. So we, we walk out and my dad had Parkinson. So the reason why I was holding my father's hand, uh, one of the reasons, because I'm always close to him anyway, <laughs> it was because his hands were shaking because he had Parkinson. I was trying to keep it still. Around that time when we were out there, we heard one of the rebel ask, whose house is this? Because our house was big. They thought it was a politician or somebody that's in the politics. And Somebody said to the rebels, oh, this is the man that gave his hotel for free to refugees. But by then, they already lit a fire on our leather chair and they put it off again. They stopped burning the house. So it was only one chair that was burned. So they didn't burn the house. They didn't burn it because they recognized that that was the man that gave his hotel for refugees to stay. And I don't know how they knew that information, but refugees have been staying in my dad's hotel that he stopped building for years for free. So they respected that. They respected that and they knew that he was not in politics. He was not in politics also. A man started walking towards you. His name was Darami. As he started to walk towards you, what did you do and what were you thinking? Well, as he walked towards me, he looked at me and I knew he was coming. By the time he said, you come here. He was one of the rebels. Yes, one of the rebels, Darami. 
as soon as he looked at me, I, I already sensed it. But when, but when he said the word, I had to let go of my dad's hand and walk towards him and not look back. I've never really looked at my, never had that vision of looking back because I prevent myself. I did it deliberately not to see my dad's reaction. Why did you walk towards him? We've heard stories too. They will rape the girl in front of the father or they will ask the child. They use that with child soldiers to kill their parents. Knowing that my dad had has already stopped me walking away. And those are the things that I did not want to happen. And I still till this day do not understand how we did not move, how, what happened after I was taken in his hands. And, and I think what also saved me and him in that moment was as soon as Darami took me, he didn't stay. He walked away with me right away with some of the girls that he had already kidnapped. He had about three girls waiting for him on the side. We started walking straight away away from my father. So that was something that I'm really thankful also because the idea that I would have stand there and him looking at me, yeah, that would have really, I don't know. I don't know if he would have handled it. And I didn't, I didn't want to see his face at all. I mean, Ada, did you know what was in store for you? the fact that you were being kidnapped and what it meant? Yes, yeah, I knew, sadly. I knew, I knew I was, um, the girls that was kidnapped, they were young girls, and I know at that stage I look. I was very petite and small. I was 18 years old. They like when your skin is a bit lighter or when, you are, when you've never been with a man before and experienced, they feel like that is a, a superstitious belief that you've got to belong to them, and that's what happened with me. Uh, with Darami. So when Darami took us, walked with us up the hill and we settled in this place. I remember the night we were almost in this old home. Me and my three other friends that he had picked up, we we shrink in this world, almost trying to get inside it because we, we knew what was going to happen. But nobody wants to be the first, nobody wants to be the last, nobody wants to be the order that he was going to call in. And we knew and we were trying to, we hold each other, but almost like you want to get into each other or get into the wall and just disappear. But we knew that was impossible. So he just started calling us one by one. And when he called me, he realized that was my first experience. My first um, intimacy with a man uh, was about five or six men or even more. So I woke up unconscious. And then we started again the journey. So the journey just continued. We didn't, you don't even have time to do or clean yourself. There's not such thing. You continue on. So as soon as that thing happened, we start moving again because the war was very intense. We have the, the soldiers, the ECOMOC government pushing through and the ECOMOC don't know who is the civilians, who is the rebels. You know, the only thing that we had to do straight away, we had to change to clothes that are darker, like this color or khaki. So it camouflage. We're not seen by the helicopter. And that's what my journey became. How long were you in that situation? How long did your kidnapping last? Um, I still don't fully remember. I, I always think it's three months. There's memory that has been blocked. My friend I was kidnapped with said it's seven months. I know every details of what happened to me, but I still don't have the time. That just became really froze to me. Were you raped for the duration of that time? Yeah, continuously. What happened with my situation that I know I asked the question why, but I didn't want that to happen to the, my friends that I was kidnapped. Darami didn't want them because he keep using the word beautiful. And I've never really, I was not familiar with the word beautiful because my dad said beauty is from the inside. So I wonder how he sees a beauty from the inside, but he didn't want the other girls. So I became more the target and he was not going to war too much. He became really extremely obsessed with me. And then he had a wife also at the same time that I was scared of because I don't want the wife to think I have any feeling for this man. So I have to, in a way, convince this woman that I don't want your husband and he has a child. But he, his obsession became really, really strong that he, he stopped going to war, so which was sort of my hell also. He had more time. So, he, yeah. In that situation, how did you and the other girls who were kidnapped with you how did you avoid becoming pregnant? I felt pregnant. Oh. I did. Well, I was not. Um, I wasn't uh, sure by who because of my first um, encounter. The first time they raped me, they called his friend. So after a couple of months, I just felt like my pants was getting tighter, and then I realized that I was feeling 
nauseous. So we've talked about those signs at girls at school. So I started noticing that I must have been pregnant, which I was. So I just tried to do everything to not have that in me. So I tried to, um, and similarly, I heard at school or rumors that if you eat a battery. A battery. A battery can be a poison. Yeah. So I tried that and I tried um, a bleach. Oh, my love. And I tried Coca-Cola because I heard that if you have Coca-Cola experience, that can trigger. So I just tried a lot of things, but I think that affects my pregnancy, which it was not almost like getting rid of the pregnancy, but I just couldn't, I do not want to ever, I didn't want to live with uh, carrying a child that I do not know who the father is, but by what had happened to me. So then I, I had a, a, a miscarriage through that. By the end of it, the end of your time, there was another soldier and you said his nickname was Cold Boot and he was particularly brutal and vicious. The night before you were released, he took you from Dharami, is that right? Yes, there was a lot of complication things that have gone between, a few things that have gone between me and Dharami that I've tried to escape one time. And then Cold Boots, I came across Cold Boot. But before I came across Cold Boot that time, I've already seen what Cold Boot is capable of during the time when I was in my house, the day I was kidnapped. So I knew he was very vicious. He was extremely vicious. And we, we know stories about him. And so for some reason, he became really fond of me. And he starts saying that his wife is called Aminata. And I did not see any affection at all. I felt really safe with him than Darami. For those moments, I felt that he was really sincere, and I believe he was. And then when he took me from Darami, because he had such a high position, Darami could not fight him, but he was really mad. And you were just property, like you were just something to be taken and passed around. My God. Yeah, but it's really incredible because for those few times that I was with Colbert, I was happy because I was not living the horror of Darami. I remember this one day when he looked at me, and I knew straight away something had changed. When he looked at me that day, I'm like, that, that is a look that he's never looked. And it was an attraction. It was a, like something he wanted. And I knew it was, he wanted me. It, something had shifted. So the night he came to the room and he tried to rape me. And I really sort of tightened my legs, not fighting him, but just tried to stiff myself, my body, my legs. What he did was he, was, he took his gun and he sort of raped me with that. And one thing after that, I thought I was going to be killed because Cold Boots was somebody that would rape a woman, a girl, and kill the person. So I, I knew, okay, this, this was going to happen, and I know what he is. So then, but the following morning, he handed me back to Darami, and I felt, I saw a shame on him that he has done that. It's incredible, and I needed to explain that in the book because somebody that I knew that was this vicious and changed and then felt ashamed that you would never think is somebody that would feel ashamed. So Cold Boot had a degree of remorse for what he'd done to you? A remorse. I saw that. And then when he handed me to Darami and uh, Darami got mad, the, mo- the following morning, and I always remember telling my friend who I was kidnapped with, Francis, I've heard that they're releasing children. I think I'm going to be released. But I did not believe what I've just said to her at all. I just said it, but something came in to say it, and I remember... Uh, Frances cried. She was crying with me because she knew it's impossible. Because the kids that were being released were much younger than you. And why would Darami ever let you go? No, Darami would never let me go. She, she cried and we cried together. And Darami at that time shot about five, seven shots on my feet because he thought that she not escape anymore. When I walk away in that few, one, less than one minute, I walk away, I was crying. I again, come across Cold Boot and the children. And then he looked at me. And he asked me to come. And when I came and he said, do you want to go? Again, I don't believe I was standing under a tree. And then I shook my head because I could not even have to say anything because the fear between the night, it's less than five hours what had happened. And he said, go. Darami had, he's so angry that he has walked away, did not come back until the evening when I was gone. You got home, you saw your dad. How was that day? Uh, <laughs> it was hard seeing my dad. I remember walking to the gate and he was sitting waiting for us. And we had a lot of people in the community waiting. He tried not to cry. It was just not the same chubby, cheeky smile, man. 
And did you have to try to be strong for him, my love? I just knew that his strength was gone. He was at the same father, and now he knew something has been taken away. And I remember him holding me and my brother, and then start because my dad cried beautifully like a woman sometimes. Could not contain it and just start crying out. And I stayed with him for three days, and he never slept. Mm. He must have not wanted to take his eyes off you. He couldn't believe you were back. He sounds like the most incredible man, Aminata, like the most... It makes me understand you so much more when you talk about him and all the qualities that he has have just been so embodied in you. Yeah. That connection is still there. Do you need to take a moment and have a, have a drink? Yeah. Are you ready to keep talking a little bit more? Yes. Okay. Your return made you quite famous in Sierra Leone and that put you in danger because Dharami wanted to come and find you. He was very angry when he found out that you'd been released and he was still obsessed with you and saw you as his, something that he owned, like an object. So how did you get safe within your country before you came to Australia? I didn't really get safe there because there's no policy, there's no program to reset, to, uh, to look after or protection at all. I was just handed back to my father and then I flew to Guinea-Conakry. In Guinea-Conakry, I stayed with my mother. Is that another city in Sierra Leone? No, it's, it's, a, it's another country. So you have Guinea, Liberia and Sierra Leone, we share the same boundary. So most of the refugees flew to Guinea because Liberia had had war. Civilian have had war, so Guinea was a safe place. And then the United Nations High Commission of Refugee was there, and they've heard of my story. So they were the one that actually made my story feel like something important. I didn't feel it was, you know, for somebody that I've got to war, I'm got to war. They're going and still living it. You don't have a time to think your your story is that special at all, and it's not because people have gone through similar. Yeah, but it is. It's funny when you say that because I've heard you interviewed before and um, Richard Feidler asked you about trauma and you laughed and you said, we don't have a word for trauma in Sierra Leone. It's just, it's just life. Yeah, it is life, yeah. And the things that you are exposed to or hear about or witness, it's just part of the fabric of your life. So this idea of recovering from trauma and dealing with trauma is something that was quite foreign to you then, wasn't it? Absolutely foreign because when I went to UNHCR and they start... That's UNHCR, the... Yes, United High Commissioner for Refugee. So but they were very interested in my case, particularly because I've been on television and I was given a letter, but also I've heard, they've heard Darami was in Sierra Leone, went to my house looking for me. So even in Guinea, I was sort of isolated, but I didn't go out much where the communities are. Because you were still in danger. Because you can't tell the difference between, yes, you can't tell the difference between the rebels and the civilian. So I stayed a lot at home. Were you scared? Did you fear that they would come back and Dharami would find you? I was not so, so much scared because nobody knew who I was in a way. And I think because the war is still going on, nobody had time to focus on that. That was significant because it became sort of the peace um, glue for the ceasefire to happen and for the war to stop the, the exchange, the negotiation that happened with myself and the children. So um, people knew of the story. It was quite famous in your country. Yes, yeah, it was quite famous, but then people started moving forward again. So UNHCR was the one that picked that on and then really tried to reset me to any refugee program that was available. And how did, how did Australia come up? Did you choose Australia or did someone pick for you? I actually, I chose Australia. I've never heard of Australia before, never, ever. I was very familiar with Europe and, and Austria because my mom has gone to Austria before. So because Guinea Conakry, the French call Australia, Australia, I assume I was going to Austria. <laughs> so you bought a warm coat. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I know it's Europe. Europe is not far from Africa. So when I got in the plane, I even waited for a long time. And the reason why I chose Australia was because I didn't want my community to recognize me. I didn't want my story to be known. I didn't want people to know my story and feel pity on helping me. You wanted to be anonymous and start again. Yes. 
I wanted to start fresh. I want people to help me because they wanted, they wanted to. When I said to the man in UNHC, I said, I want to go to Australia. He said, but you don't know anyone. It's very far. It's another place. So he was very concerned that I was coming to this country and being that traumatized, I would get actually more trauma. But I don't know what he was talking about. And then he said, if you're going to go, you got to find somebody that will come with you. So that's how I, ch- I looked for my sister. And my sister came with me because they didn't want me to travel to Australia by myself. So your sister emigrated with you to Australia, came as a refugee? With me, yes. Was your sister into it? Yeah, my sister was very excited because she was in an American program and she joined in straight away. And we came together. We went through France and Singapore and then Sydney. It took us three days. It took us three days to get here. <laughs> and I was really, I'm like, oh, maybe something is wrong with my mind. Maybe this is not even real. <laughs> I thought, okay, something is going on. So we finally got to Sydney. You were settled in the outer western suburbs of Sydney. What were your impressions of some of the things in Australia that you found weird? When I, when I came, first I was shocked by that. I was not shocked. To be honest, I, I know people are shocked by the story now, by the apartment that I was staying because it was not furnished. It was, they've told us this story that we come in, we have a home. So I have to be sleeping on, the, on a mattress on the floor. So you just went into an apartment that was empty? Empty. And I had to enroll myself at school. I have to do everything for myself. Get Centrelink. They took us to Centrelink. We got money. I lived with $270 for years. $270 is what you get from Centrelink. Yeah, that's what I would get every fortnight, every two weeks. Every two weeks. And you had to pay rent and clothes and food. Yeah. Wow. And there were many times that I've, the only time I felt starvation is when I was kidnapped. But in Australia, there were many times I starved. I didn't have food because the money was not enough. And there was no refugee program. There was nothing to really help refugees settle. We were the first refugee that we settled, and this is over 20 years ago. So we were the first refugee that we settled, and we just got put into school, put into a home, and voila, then you sort yourself out. So I had to do all that on my own. I think what became really strange for me in Australia, because I found out that I was a strange person <laughs> because I didn't know I was a black girl. I, I didn't know I was black. I really did, never really occurred to us uh, African. People were very curious about where I'm from, if I've seen a lion. <laughs> I remember a girl asked me if I sleep next to a lion. And then I remember saying to them, oh, I've seen a lion <laughs> or animals, but it's in Taranga Zoo because I've never seen these things before. So I think it was more the question because I grew up very Western in Sierra Leone. So it was a question that was being asked that really was strange to me. I could not make sense of it. And I remember somebody asking me if I've ever eaten a, no, do you eat rats? Do you eat rats? Yes. And I said, but rat is poisonous. Nobody eats rat. That can kill you because nobody eats rat. And then I, 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 that question played in my mind. And then I remember one day I was sitting watching TV and then World Vision came and they had a boy holding a rat. And they're talking about hunger and starvation. Oh, so that's why people thought you'd eaten rats because you're from Africa. So they assumed you were starving. Yeah, so then I started putting the dots. So all my time in Australia, I was trying to put the dot to things people were saying or people were looking at me or people, if there was a racial reaction, I don't know what race is. I don't know what racism was. So I didn't understand. If somebody treated me different, I go, okay, they don't like me. And then I move forward. So for me, it's just, it was not because of what I look like. Aminata, how did you meet Antoine? Oh, I met um, Antoine, I met 2007 at the Sydney Opera House. It was an ex-boyfriend's birthday that I didn't want to go to the, to the dinner. I'm like, who's going to go and sit there and start feeling sorry and what, what is to happen? And I remember going to Bondi. <laughs> I got a train to Bondi to go to Beverly Hills. And I, for some reason, I got off the train at Sakilaki to go to the Opera House. And I, I sat there reading at the Opera Bar and I walk, trying to get to the train station again to go home. It was February, so it was a very bright day. And then as I was walking, I heard a music playing. Some a live band was playing down at the opera bar. And Richard Franklin, I love Richard Franklin. And, and then I stayed just in that, like literally less than two minutes, stayed to listen to the song. Then Antoine came up to me and said hi. And he has this baby smile that he has almost every day. I'm grumpy in the morning. <laughs> Antoine is always smiling. I'm like, why? What is happening again? Um, he has this beautiful baby smile. Like, oh God. And and I go like, yes. And then he speaks, and I knew he was French. And I thought he wanted me to take a photo of him at the opera house. Obviously, uh, he was visiting. It was his first day at the opera house. 
And then he said, oh, can I stay with you? And then I thought, what? And then he, knew, he noticed that he has asked, said the wrong thing. <laughs> and I said, no, to stay with you and, and talk. And then, yeah, we stayed and talked for three hours. And he didn't speak English, but I understood French. Oh, wow. Yeah, we, we did sign language. We did so many things in that three hours. And then we walked to the train station. And I remember him hugging me. He hugged me tight. <laughs> now, this is weird. <laughs> So you didn't have a sneaky patch on that first night? No sneaky kisses? No, he kissed me on the cheek, like with a, like a really happy kiss, and then he hugged me. But the hug was more, some, I was like, oh, this is a personal space. But because he hugged me tight, like he, he had knew me for a long time. And it became really weird because he's going to Bondi, but then he's not moving. He's waiting for me to go first because I'm going to the airport. <laughs> And my train came really slow and, I, and he's smiling. I'm thinking, I don't know how to smile anymore from the other side. <laughs> yeah. And as soon as I got home, he wait until I got in my train. He didn't take his train because the Bondi train came faster. And then I got home and he messaged me and then we became friends. We just meet all the time at the opera house. And yeah. And- That's a beautiful love story. I wanted to ask you, and and you don't have to answer this, but because your first sexual experience was under such horrific circumstances, how did you reclaim your relationship with your body and with sex and start associating it with pleasure instead of trauma? Yeah, it was extremely difficult. It was really difficult. First, when I came to Australia, um, you know, when you're little, when you're girls at school, you have so many stories. I I remember uh, some of the girls would say, if you have had sex, but you don't have sex for a long time, you will sort of reversion. Mm. Yeah, it closes up. <laughs> and I remember when I came to Australia, I did not have a relationship for years because I thought that would really kind of cleanse me back and put me back in, in a really good space. So I did not have a relationship. I was a love fashion, but the idea of being told beautiful, beautiful was very something that I didn't want to associate with. Yeah, the word beautiful is very hard for you to hear, isn't it? Because I was yes. going to, I was careful not to say, hi, beautiful, or you look beautiful, because that's a very triggering word, because that's what Dharami used to say to you. Yeah, but I, because I, I dress up always, all the time, and people say that, so it took a long time for me to understand where it was going. And I loved men. I've never really, my experience, I've never once made me felt any kind of resentful to men. I was so looking forward to fall in love. I had my father to give me that. I've never got like, I was determined the life that I'm living now, I visioned that. I wanted it for myself. I wanted it for the universe. I wanted to give back something because my dad really gave that to me. So for me, I think really when I, um, when I start having those experience with men, I didn't want to have sex in the daylight, nor with light. And my legs will shake as if it's like a thunder, like I'm standing on a thunder. It will constantly shake. So I, I have that experience. I think it was my experience with Cold Boat. But even when I was doing the Bokem Hills African Ladies Troop. Your stage show, yeah. Yes, Rose. Notice if I get triggered, my legs will be tapping on the floor. Really, they can't control it. It will really tap. So that has become a thing. But when I met Antoine and we had that sort of relationship because he was the first man that I, I wanted him to know everything that have happened to me. I was never going to marry to a man or be with somebody in that extent that will not know who I am, but also have an understanding that I own my story. I am in control of it. I tell it the way I want to tell it, not even my children own it. And I wanted to have that ownership of how I tell it. So I think that really became such a a beautiful, different experience once that was there. And with Antoine, it's never been the case. But all other relationships, that was very much. It took a while without them not knowing, you know. You kept it to yourself because you didn't want to give that part of yourself. When you fell pregnant with uh, Serafina, it was a very difficult birth, wasn't it? And you nearly died. As if you haven't suffered enough. Just that. not very <laughs> fair. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sarafina experience was very different because we, um, again, in the West, baby shower, we did all that. And you, especially in Australia, no woman goes to hospital and thinking, I'm not going to see my child. You know, so of course I didn't think of that. And I don't know the depth of maternal health. When I went to the hospital and Sarafina was about 10 days late, and we started having a complication. And I remember the room just went quiet and my mom's face was on the wall. She could not look. And my sister was quiet. Your mom was there. My mom was in the room 
my sister was there. And Antoine, who had had a music prepared for me, was really quiet, was really scared. I could see it in his eyes. And it just really went bad. And I remember the doctor coming in, who was visiting that day, and look at the whole situation. Because I was already late for caesarean. There was no caesarean option. And I've had epidural, so I'm already, my legs cannot be moved until somebody moved me. But the position that I was in, I just heard her say to the doctors, if only she can turn, but I cannot turn because my legs cannot move itself. But the moment I heard her say that, I knew almost that was a saving thing for, for me to do that. I flipped. <gasps> I flipped to the other side. That's impossible. And then she went in and without gloves and just pulled the seraphina. I didn't know consciously that when I have epidural, I couldn't turn. I didn't know that. Yeah. So when she said that, if only she could turn, I thought she wanted me to turn. So then I flipped. So she came to me after the baby was born. She goes like, I've never seen that before. And I go like, I didn't know that I could not turn. (laughs) It's all like, have you not met me? I can do amazing things. (laughs) (laughs) So you're living this life now where you've started the Aminata Maternal Foundation to help young mothers and, and pregnant women back in Sierra Leone. What's your life like today? You've had another baby, Matisse. I have a beautiful, delicious baby. She's, they're really kind babies. They're really, really kind. They're beautiful. How old are your kids now and what, what's your life like today? Oh, Serafina is eight and Matisse is seven. And my life is full on every day, like almost seven days fully running with the foundation. When I realized about the problem in Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone have the highest infant maternal mortality death in the world. One in 17, which is really not even correct, but one in 70 women and babies die. Uh, while in Australia, it's one to 8,700. So for me, my father always said, when you've learned something, you've got a responsibility to do something. So I just take that journey on. I started at eight years when Sarafina was born, the whole journey of it. So I'm fully always meeting people, trying to get information there about maternal health. Sierra Leone is really struggling. They've gone through war. They've gone through Ebola, now COVID. They've never really had that strong international support. And for me, I knew that was, a, that was going to be a really hard target. But I knew that if somebody like me do not push through again, the country will be once forgotten. So it, it has not been a, as every business. It has not been an easy journey, which is not, but it has been the most rewarding. I wake up every day, honest to God. I thank, I'm like, thank you for choosing me to be, to do this, to be part of it. It's being part of humanity. And I truly believe that human rights, the core of human rights should start from childbirth. It's preventable. No woman, no woman should die for just because of due to poverty and their baby should die. And when I came to Australia, hearing all those feminists and all these words, and I'm like, if we're fighting that, we have to fight first. Birth. If we give equal rights to people, children coming to this world, then we can also target the other issue. <laughs> so I believe that birth is where we all connect. And that's where I believe also that this is a cause for every single person because I want somebody to name one person that didn't come out of a woman. We all did. So I, you don't need to be a mother, you're auntie, you're gay, you're uh, Catholic. It doesn't matter what you are. No mother or child should die due to poverty. That is something that we can control. We can't control war. You know, so for me, this is why I'm so passionate about it. We cannot control war. We cannot control sickness. But bringing a life, we have the ability to do, make it come. Everybody have a joyful experience, the mothers. That's obviously, I think that's my passion. I love it. I think about these mothers and babies all the time, all the time. I've heard you talk about this for so many years and your eyes just light up and you, the passion in your voice, nothing about your journey has been easy. Nothing about your life has been easy, Aminata, but you are just the personification of grace and joy and courage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Wow. Well, I hope you agree that That is a particularly incredible and, I don't know, inspiring is such an overused word, but inspiring story to tell on International Women's Day. Aminata is one of the most incredible women I've met. We are so lucky to have her here in Australia and here in the world. 
Her book, Rising Heart, is available now. We'll chuck a link in the show notes so that you can buy it because it's really brilliant. She's such a riveting storyteller. And if you want to learn more about her foundation, the Aminata Maternal Foundation, we'll also put a link in the show notes for that. And if you've got a couple of spare dollars this International Women's Day and you want to do something for the sisters, there's no better place to put those spare dollars. This episode was produced by Leah Porges and Mel Zauer. The executive producer of No Filter is Eliza Ratliff. I'm Mia Friedman and I'll see you at mamamia.com.au.